Welcome back, and if you're new here, welcome. I hope you all had a lovely holiday with your friends and family and just really got to enjoy that time, that little miniature break from reality where we spend with those who are closest to us. It's really nice to just take a moment, even if it's just for yourself. But I do want to give a disclaimer this week that we're covering another difficult subject. Today, we're discussing the death of Alexander Harris, He was a seven-year-old boy who was murdered, and to this day, the case remains cold. So, as always, sit back, relax, and let's dive in. Alexander Harris was a seven-year-old boy from Mountain View, California. Alex, his mother Roxanne, and maternal grandparents were on a trip for a family reunion for Thanksgiving. After the holiday weekend was over, the Harris family were driving back home when they decided to make a stop at the Whiskey Pete's Hotel and Casino Resort in Prem, Nevada for an afternoon of fun. Around 11 a.m., Alex wandered into an adjacent video arcade while his mom and grandparents went to a nearby gambling room. It is unclear how much time had passed, but when the family returned for Alex, he was gone. Eyewitnesses recalled a man took Alex by the arm and led him out of the casino. They also stated he didn't appear to be in distress as he wasn't calling for help. They didn't worry because they thought the man was the boy's father due to the uncanny resemblance between the two. Roxanne immediately reported Alex is missing due to the boy's father not being present at the time. Police arrived and the family was immediately ruled out as suspects. Other witnesses claimed they saw a boy walking down the hallway with a man. Now, it is unknown if this boy was positively identified as Alexander Harris. The suspect and the boy were caught on surveillance tapes but it remains unclear if these tapes even still exist and whether they have been re-examined with current technology to enhance images for a positive identification. Through eyewitness testimonies, police completed two sketches which made things kind of confusing. One drawing showed a man approximately 5'7 to 5'9 weighing between 160 to 175 pounds. With straight, collar-length blonde hair and wearing silver wire-rimmed glasses, they also stated that he was wearing a brown jacket on top of dark pants. The second sketch suggests a taller man at approximately 6 feet and 170 pounds with sandy blonde hair and round wire-rimmed glasses. It appears after the police saw surveillance tapes and talked to eyewitnesses that there were discrepancies between the two, but eventually it was agreed on that the suspect was a man approximately six feet tall, weighing 170 pounds, with blonde straight cropped hair and wearing glasses that were wire rimmed. Over the next few weeks, police were hitting dead ends. The property had been searched, but the boy was nowhere to be found. They were facing mounting pressure from the public and consistent criticism for the way they seemed to be ignoring this case. More than a month after Alex's disappearance, his body was discovered by a worker under a trailer near the casino. He was fully clothed in the same outfit he was wearing when he went missing. Police found his glasses nearby which produced a latent fingerprint. They also found blonde hair strands not belonging to Alex on his body. Police began compiling suspects based on guests who were checked in and employees who matched the description. Two of the men brought in provided alibis, but the third man's didn't seem to be strong enough to deflect suspicions. The third suspect was checking in as a guest at the casino hotel. His name was Howard Lee Hopped. Hopped was a computer programmer from San Diego who was staying in town because he was attending a land sailing tournament. 
Hopped resembled the man seen with the boy, and police seemed to believe that Hopped was in fact the man responsible. His photo was included in a lineup with a few hotel workers that also fit the description. The results of this lineup, however, were inconclusive. Eyewitnesses couldn't pinpoint Hopped or anyone else out of the photos presented. Regardless, police and FBI chose to move forward with Hopped as the perpetrator. Hopped had returned to San Diego by this point, and since there was insufficient evidence to bring him across state lines, they chose to bring witnesses to him, including at his place of work. Investigators asked the witnesses any time Hopped walked in if they had recognized anyone, and this was after his photo had already been shown in the photo lineup. From this second round, Hopped was positively identified by the eyewitnesses brought to San Diego. He was arrested on February 19, 1988. Investigators spent three to four hours trying to make him confess to the crime. He was held in the San Diego County Jail until he was put on a plane to Las Vegas at the end of February 1988. Police had him lie flat in the back of an unmarked police car with a jacket over his face to shield him from the press as he was taken to Clark County Detention Center. Attorneys presented opening arguments on January 13, 1989. The trial lasted for five weeks, but it took the jury just one day to acquit Hopped of the charges for the kidnapping and murder of Alexander Harris. The jury stated the testimony of the eyewitnesses were unreliable due to Hopped's defense attorney pointing out all of the conflicting statements. Eyewitnesses were unfairly influenced to identify Hopped as the suspect. Additionally, the search of Hopped's home and vehicles revealed no physical evidence to link Hopped to Harris. Eyewitnesses also changed testimony on the stand, mainly around the description of the suspect seen with Alex. Hopped was described as a victim of mistaken identity. It was believed he was a scapegoat for the police who failed to find the boy until December 30th, even though the grounds had been searched by police for two days after he disappeared. About a year after his acquittal, Hopped filed a $4 million lawsuit against the Metro Police and Detectives Tom Dillard and Robert Leonard. He alleged the detectives and the department conspired to violate his civil rights. He stated detectives misused photos taken from Whiskey Pete's arcade, and the police filed false and misleading affidavits to secure a search warrant. He cited the police also tried to coerce a confession out of him. J. Pat Horton, an attorney who litigated the case, stated, quote, Hopped was picked as a suspect first, then tried to stack evidence against him. They did everything they could in terms of twisting evidence, ignoring evidence, and misrepresenting evidence. They were bound and determined to convict him, end quote. Police ignored clear evidence such as the strands of hair found on Alexander and the latent fingerprint on his glasses. Granted, the fingerprint was compared to Hop's fingerprint, but due to differences, there was no substantial connection to be made. After litigation, Hop was awarded a single dollar in general damages and one million dollars in punitive damages. Court records show the case was fought for more than seven years. A federal judge ruled the award was excessive and threw out the punitive damages. Hopped agreed to not pursue a judgment if he had the attorney fees reimbursed. Even after 33 years, Hopped claims he suffers from emotional trauma and turmoil from the mistreatment of the police. Hopped forgave the witnesses who claimed he was the one responsible. He felt that they too were victims of the investigation. No further arrests have been made on this case, along with no new leads coming forward. Alexander Harris's case isn't well known. It's difficult to find much information about this case, and that really breaks my heart. It has been cold for 33 years, and the family deserves some answers. If the evidence has been properly preserved, such as his clothing, his glasses, or even if that surveillance tape has been kept all this time, 
I feel it deserves another look, especially with our current technological advances with forensic science. Alexander is owed one more effort. This child didn't deserve to die. Roxanne Harris needs answers for what happened to her son. So, um, this was a difficult one to put together. Not only because this case literally has hardly any digital footprint, but also because it's so heartbreaking. I don't understand why this isn't a bigger deal than what it is. This poor boy has gone unnoticed for so long, and I just can't believe it. But I do want to uh, give a quick shout out to the viewer who suggested this, because I wasn't aware of this, of this topic until they had sent me a message. So thank you. Anyways, if you guys enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and, you know, let me know you're enjoying the content. And if you're not subscribed yet, join us. It keeps you up to date with the uploads and plus, we would love to have you here. I also want to just continue to thank you all for your kind words and support. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.